Good morning, everyone. And I think being short, I hate podia. <laughs> um, so I'm going to wander around a little bit, but I, I need to be close enough to, to change the slides. And so, one, I want to thank Joe for an excellent pr presentation. And I built this assuming that two things, that he would do the excellent job he did and that you will remember what he said. Um, because I'm not going to repeat a lot of it, but I'm going to build on it as we talk about the differences between microbiological and chemical risk assessments. And the thing I want to emphasize here is, is we're going to be I'm going to be talking about a lot about dealing with biodiversity as we go through this process. So, but I did want to give a historical con uh, construct here. Um, there was a, a very important FAO WHO consultation in 1995 that looked at the application of risk analysis to food standards issues. And they were very positive about doing chemical risk assessments and thought that that would be something that you ought to put into it. But the basic conclusion at the end of this that was, th was that the risk assessment techniques for microbial food safety issues were not likely to be available in the near term. Um, and that was because the microbiological food safety issues were uh, too complex to be amenable to formal risk assessment techniques. Well, it's one of those things that um, things change very rapidly. So just about the time that that report came out, the first of the research risk assessments for microbiology started coming out. And then by the period of 1998 uh, to 2003, we saw the first uh, published and, and use of risk assessments in microbiology by the United States government and also by governments in other places. So it was a rapidly changing field. Part of it was a rapidly changing field because uh, this was the air when all of a sudden everybody had PCs on their desk and we had to figure out what to use them for. We had uh, about 10 years of work internationally in doing predictive microbiology so we could start to describe the behavior of organisms in mathematical terms. And uh, we also had the, the first of the, the PC-based simulation modeling software, which, which was incredibly important for advancing microbial risk assessment. We also had some really strong incentives uh, to be able to do this kind of stuff. Uh, one of them in the United States was the 1994 Agricultural Department Reorganization Act that's for the first time demanded that we would do risk assessments for major regulations. And so this was something that we were supposed to be able to do, even though we hadn't a clue of how to do it at the time. We also saw at this time the signing of the WTO, SBS, and TBT agreements that basically said that you needed to do a risk assessment if there was a challenge in terms of food safety issues. Uh, and this particularly got around in terms of equivalence and microbiological criteria. So, I want to emphasize the fact that uh, we built on, in doing microbiological risk assessments, particularly quantitative ones, we built on what we knew from the, the chemical risk assessment error. Many of the original players in, in microbial risk assessments were trained as food safety people, which meant that they were a combination of microbiology and toxicology. So we had a, that kind of background. We take, basically took the same format of hazard identification, exposure assessment, hazard characterization, which is largely dose response evaluations, and then finally a risk characterization. What did not come out and what we did not use to any great extent is that there's a general lack of use of safety assessments. And so I will explain a little bit about where safety assessments can be used in microbial risk assessment and where they are generally not used um, in most of those. Okay, so the general approach is similar, but what I want to do is highlight some of the difference between chemicals and microorganisms that require different approaches. Uh, it's 
important to understand how microorganisms cause disease, and so this becomes a critical factor, that the concentration, there are issues about estimating the concentration, and you'll notice I put that in, in, in brackets there. Theoretically, you don't have concentrations of microorganisms, you have population densities. But we do, you know, so that we can talk with the chemists, we, we refer to them as concentrations. We have huge differences in the susceptibility of humans to microorganisms, which I'll talk about. And we also have a, a, where the foods that a microorganism is in can affect both the microorganism and also the host responses. And then throughout my talk, I'll talk a lot about biodiversity. Uh, biodiversity. Okay, so some of the things that are different. Uh, one of the things in chemical risk assessments is you have to figure out what is the, is it the identify what the hazard is. In most cases when we're dealing with microbiology, this is not the case. Typically, we have a huge amount of data that has characterized the syndromes we're dealing with. This is also, typically, we have a substantial amount of epidemiological data. And in a few instances, we actually have human trials, particularly if it's done in conjunction with the development of vaccines. So you have the development of vaccines, and the controls actually give us information about human susceptibility. While we use animal models on occasion, uh, the use of animal models in many cases just confuses the issue because you always have to convert the animal data into something that is appropriate for humans. And uh, I might note here, also in a microbial risk assessment, there is typically much more emphasis on exposure assessment and uh, very often the exposure assessment is going to be highly complex. So the important thing to remember in this is you're talking about a microbial disease. What you're really talking about is a balance between three different biological entities. You have the biology of the, the pathogen that you're dealing with. You have the biology of the consuming host which in this case is going to be a human. And then you also have the biological variability of the food. And each of these are biological entities that have a high degree of variability. Okay, another thing that's going to be inter of interest here, because it's really one that's going to be con somewhat confusing as I get into dose-response relations, is, is microbial risk are generally acute in nature. They are as a result of the body's response to a single exposure. This includes most of the diseases that we'll be talking about, caused by bacteria, viruses, protozoa, uh, toxic algae, parasites, and their se chronic sequela. And I'll come back to chronic sequela. The, as you increase the number of exposures, in any one host, in any one human, what you have is the likelihood that you're going to, to develop immunity. So this case, uh, the, what we typically used in, in looking at risk is a naive human. Someone that has not been exposed to the agent has no predetermined immunity. Now I might note that there are a couple of exceptions. Um, if we're dealing with things involved with toxigenic fungi, or with marine toxins where we potentially get a bioaccumulation as a result of multiple exposures, they may require us to have a different type of dose-response relationship. Okay, so it's important here, I'm going to start going into some consideration of dose-response relationships, and I want to emphasize the fact that it's critical that you understand the underlying mechanism of pathogenicity. And we differentiate four types if you include the, the, the parasites, the, the worms. But the important ones for most foods are if they are infectious, toxico-infectious, or toxigenic.
And so just to put these in a context so that you understand what the mechanism is, an infectious agent is one that gets into the human body and at a site, it can either be in the intestinal tract or it can be at a site far away from the original uh, intestinal tract introduction that you have the, the effect. For toxi toxico-infectious, these are organisms that infect the intestinal tract they produce toxins that then migrate across the, the intestinal barrier and then have an effect somewhere within the body. And then toxigenic, we're here we're going to talk about organisms that grow in a food, they produce a chemical, a toxin, that then goes in once you've ingested the food and causes a, a, a problem. So, it's important here because these are going to determine what kinds of models we have to use. So, if you're talking about a toxigenic organism, one where it's producing a chemical within the, the food and then that's ingested, and the classic examples here would be Clostridium botulinum neurotoxin or Staph aureus enterotoxin. These are ones that are amenable to a threshold model. And so you can actually do a safety assessment if you need to with these organisms. The exceptions to these is if the chemical that is produced is a carcinogen, then you're out of the threshold model and you need to fall back to a non-threshold model, uh, similar to what Joe was talking about. For infectious and toxico-infectious microorganisms, and these are the most of the types of organisms that we're going to be talking about in terms of food safety. These are all non-threshold models. Because here what we have is a situation where you have the issue of, these are individual organisms. They have the capability of reproducing. And you have the potential for a single cell a single cell ingested, if it gets into the right place at the right time, is going to be f a, have a definable probability of producing an infection. So when I was originally learning a lot about microbiology, you had the concept of minimum infectious dose. And they kept doing bigger and bigger experiments with more and more animals to try to find what the true minimum infectious dose was. Finally, by the early 90s, they gave up because they realized that this is independent action, that while the probability may be incredibly small, it is not zero. And that as you take in a bigger and bigger dose, as you increase the number of cells that you take, you in accordingly increase the probability. And so what we use is primarily um, non-threshold models where we either have a linear or a log-linear extrapolation in the low-dose region. So I just do want to point out that this is one of the things that's very confusing. Um, the, you have a tendency to produce and present this kinds of data in the traditional um, linear versus log concentration of the dose. It gives you a classic sigmoidal curve, and you would look at that and say, oh, I have a threshold. And the answer is, no, you don't have a threshold, particularly when you're dealing with large number of microorganisms. And so we tend to have a, use a log-log expression for this. So where you see the, this, these are the same growth, this is the same dose-response curve, but the one in the, on the right is a log-log transformation. So what you see here is most of the curve is linear as you go down in terms of the overall probability of disease. The other thing that we have a challenge in dealing with dose response assessments is the huge variability and susceptibility of the population that's going to consume the food. Because you're going to deal with people that are exquisitely sensitive to the organisms because they're immunocompromised, they have underlying diseases, etc. And then you can go all the way up to the other extreme where a big chunk of the population will be totally immune to the disease as long as their, their immune system is functioning properly. 
So one of the ways we get around this in, in terms of decision making is we tend to look and separate populations into whether they are immune challenged or not immune challenged. And this also reduces the amount of uncertainty because we're dealing with specific populations that, for which there is much, more, much less variability. If not, you're going to have the, uh, if you're dealing with the general population, you get this kind of range of uncertainty similar to what we're seeing up there in the top, which can go just span, you know, orders of magnitudes in terms of individuals. So just to give you an example of this and how important this can be, this is the dose response curves that were used in a, 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 a uh, FAO risk assessment where we examined and looked at the, the, the potential. And what you see here is that for the general population, that's the value at the bottom of those curves. That's the simplest one. And if you go all the way up top to the, for at least for the population, we have data. This would be people that had just received a, a transplant uh, in terms of listeria susceptibility. This is a four order of magnitude difference in terms of their relative susceptibility, despite the fact that they all still have this, uh, in this model, um, this linear extrapolation. Okay, the other thing that's unique about microbial risk assessments is um, the huge changes that can take place in terms of the population. And it's important to note that the, what you're looking for is you're trying to estimate what goes into the consumer's mouth. That's the only value that counts. And so this is highly dependent on the frequency of contamination, the level of contamination, the serving sizes that are consumed, the frequency of consumption, the storage conditions, etc. And the challenge here is that um, unlike chemical uh, risk assessments, which usually assume a relatively stable level of the compound, and that, that way they can go measure it somewhere earlier in the food chain, we get most of our data that same way. We do it in the food chain, but you're going to have to take into account the likely scenarios that are going to lead to either huge increases or huge decreases in the organism before you actually consume it. And so you can go and let's see if I have a, yeah, here's a couple of us short examples just to show you how dramatic the changes can be. If you're talking about a temperature abused product that's last been at, at held at an improper temperature overnight, you can go basically from one cell up to a billion without blinking an eye. Conversely, if a consumer cooks the product just before they consume it, you're going to go from 10 billion down to zero or close to zero in a few minutes. The other thing that confuses all this is, is often the distribution of the organism is going to be non-homogeneous or non-random, and so you may actually have to deal with figuring out what is going to be the distribution in a, a product or a, a lot of food. Okay, some of the other things that you're going to have to take into account when trying to do an, unique features of food organisms is very often we will have secondary infections. The classic example is a, uh, a norovirus infection on a cruise ship. You, have to, you get one person that comes in with it, gets sick, and uh, then gets uh, the other thousand people on the cruise ship ill. And you have to turn the boat around, et cetera. The other one we have to deal with is multiple biological endpoints. So which of the different aspects of a disease do you look at? Do you look at simple gastroenteritis, someone getting sick? And that would, could be up to 100% of the people being infected in a salmonella outbreak. About 2% of the people that get sick in a salmonella outbreak will display reactive arthritis, a long-term sequela. You'll get about 1% of the people displaying septicemia, and these can be life-threatening, et cetera. 
And you also have the potential for multiple infections. You can get a substantial amount of confusion if you're basing your dose response curves on epidemiological data because you can have non-food vehicles. You can have issues with asymptomatic carriers where you'll get a number of the people that are just don't, despite having taken a huge dose, show no symptoms because they have a, an immune response. And then it'll get confusing when you're dealing with certain types of organisms. So for example, with Campylobacter or with Salmonellosis in poultry, it's probably not the poultry that actually was consumed. It was a cross-contamination in the kitchen leading to things like leafy greens being exposed, et cetera. Now, I might note this isn't necessarily a problem. Over the last 25 years, the predictive microbiologists have developed good models for all of these, and they're getting better as they go along. So, just summarizing it to keep us on time, microbiological risks are diverse and typically characterized by adverse effects from a single exposure. There are large variations in the susceptibility of the host. The you have the potential for microbial growth and act in inactivation that has to be accounted for when you're trying to, to estimate the risk. You have huge diversity among the more, with the microorganisms, both in things like growth rate and also relative pathogenicity. Uh, so you'll get some organisms that are really highly variant. And you'll have the same organism, and, but the next one that comes in is only mildly virulent. We have a s substantial amount of data in terms of actual cases, and so that gives us a, a, an advantage. Like I said, we usually don't have to do a, a hazard identification, and we also have a lot of epidemiological data that we can actually use to develop uh, based on, on uh, attack rates used to make pretty good estimates of certain dose-response relationships. And then we have a whole library of different models that will help us with this. And so that's been a really big boon. So the other thing I might want to note here is there is, uh, you know, substantially when we started this in the, in the beginning, there were huge differences in chemical and microbiological ones. As we started to learn more, there are fewer, particularly as we start to approach this from a more mechanistic approach. And so the one thing I did want to point out, there was a, a exercise that was published in 2009 in conjunction with the ILSI. It was called the Key Event Framework. And what we were looking for is a way of doing risk assessments, making decisions where we're based on more of a mechanistic thing a mechanistic approach, so that we showed that there was really similarity in all the different types of risk assessments that were done. Chemical, microbiological, uh, allergies, nutritional types of things. And so um, this was, a, I thought, was a really groundbreaking um, approach. Uh, regretfully, it hasn't really been picked up. And so I'd certainly like to see Ilse try to dust that off and bring it out again. So with that, I want to express my appreciation for Ilse for inviting me to do this. It's one of my favorite subjects, and I can take questions now or at the end. And I think I'm going to try and keep those limited so our last speaker, who has a lot of slides, gets through them, because he's going to give us real examples of each of these. Okay, I'm done. Uh, looks like you've got a question. Hi. Um, John Field from Health Canada. Thank, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was very, very helpful. I kind of, I'm actually a toxicologist and I... Can I, can I ask you to do a favor? Because sure. mostly with the acoustics of this room, I can't hear a word you're saying. Could you come up to the front, this, Mike? Sure. Yeah, it's bouncing off the back wall. We're hearing yeah. it twice. Okay. Hi. Uh, is that better? Yeah, a little, a little bit. A little bit? Either that or I'll walk down the stand next <laughs> Okay. Um, I, I'm John Field. I'm from Health Canada. I'm actually a toxicologist, so I'm, I'm learning about all the microbial approaches through this. And I can't help but think that there's a bit of a difference in culture, maybe, 
it, within toxicological risk assessment and microbial risk assessment because within toxicological risk assessment, it's just sort of, there's a lot of conservatism built into it to account for a lot of the uncertainties. Like they're, they're the same, some of the same sorts of uncertainty, you know, you, you, you might have, uh, you might not have a good animal model that, that's uh, representative of humans. You might not be sure about your exposures. You know, you, you, there's a lot of uncertainty in that, in that as well. Maybe not as much, but there is some. So you're, you're building in a lot of conservatism to account for that, and it allows you, uh, so, so say uh, you find a rat that's, uh, you, you have a harmful effect at 1,000 uh, uh, milligrams per kilogram. You might say then that a human should only be exposed to one milligram per kilogram. Um, what it allows you to do is make decisions and, uh, and rank sort of priorities. So I just wonder, using it in that sense, and, and, uh, and the other thing that goes with this too is if you, you build a lot of conservatism into something and then you, you find that there's no big deal at the end anyway, then that allows you to move on. So I just wonder why some of this couldn't be applied to, to microbial assessment. Okay, so let's... I'll try to answer your question in a, in a very general, because you asked a big question um, in, in terms of where we were. Um, a safety assessment is a combination of a risk assessment and a risk management decision. You build into that evaluation preconceived or pre-established uh, biases in terms of what the end product is and your estimates are. That's fine as long as everybody understands what it is and it's successful and it has a, a you know, a 30 plus year history of being successful. And when we started to attack the uh, microbial risk assessments, we quickly realized that we're going to have to go to a, an approach that's much more similar to the approach that's needed for carcinogens because they're non-thresholded models. We also made a very large attempt not to include um, sort of conservative estimates of what's going on. We tried to come up and say, okay, not only are you, this is what your values, but here's the range of biovariability, and here's the, the uh, uncertainty you have in these kinds of estimates. So l luckily, most, as far as I'm concerned, most of the microbial risk assessments that have done do not use a lot of conservative estimates. They try to present that, the whole array of uncertainty to the people that have to make a decision. So that's about the best answer I can give you right now. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. So I just Well, we've had a first course and a second course.